To download more lectures, learn more about our project, and to help support it, visit www.bayyina.com slash dream. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H slash dream. You are free to share these recordings with family and friends. Thank you and Jazakumullah Khairan for helping us make our dream a reality. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا الشمس كورت وإذا النجوم كدرت وإذا الجبال سيرت وإذا العشار عطلت وإذا الوحوش حشرت وإذا البحار سجرت وإذا النفوس زوجت وإذا الموؤودة سئلت بأي ذنب قتلت وإذا الصحف نشرت وإذا السماء كشطت وإذا الجحيم سعرت وإذا الجنة أزلفت علمت نفس ما أحضرت فلا أقسم بالخنس الجوار الكنس والليل إذا عسعس والصبح إذا تنفس إنه لقول رسول كريم ذي قوة عند ذي العرش مكين مطاع ثم أمين وما صاحبكم بمجنون ولقد رآه بالأفق المبين وما هو على الغيب بضنين وما هو بقول شيطان الرجيم فأين تذهبون إن هو إلا ذكر للعالمين لمن شاء منكم أن يستقيم وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله رب العالمين رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى we're beginning our study of سورة التكوير the surah following سورة عبسة in the مصحف uh, just a brief few comments about how this surah connects and ties into what has already been discussed in the previous surahs. First and foremost, the two words that describe the events of the last day in the last two surahs were الطامة and الصاخة. These were the two engulfing فإذا جاءت الطامة and then فإذا جاء جاءت الصاخة. Right? الطامة was the overwhelming, engulfing, surrounding calamity. الصاخة was a word used for the second blowing of the trumpet. It was the, the screeching, deafening noise or sound that is going to initiate the resurrection. This surah begins with almost a tafsir of those two things. It begins in, in what graphic depicted way is the day of judgment, the day of resurrection, so overwhelming and so profound in, in, its, you know, in the images that are going to be depicted. Now, the previous surah ended with a uh, depiction of what's going to happen to a person after the sakha is, is uh, pronounced. So now we learned over there, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ and so on and so forth. The person is running away from his family members and so on and so forth. So this was a personal image, an image of what's going on with the people on the earth. Now there's, it's almost like the camera has shifted focus. And the camera has turned towards the sky. What's going to be happening in the sky while this is going on on the earth? 
and then it's going to come a little, the, sky, the, the stars, and then it's going to go to the mountains, and then from the mountain it's going to go to Al-Ishar and Wuhush. We're going to talk about these things. So it's, it's almost as though the previous surah ended with an image of the people, the chaos going on within the people on the day of resurrection, and now the imagery has changed, and another scene on the same day is being depicted, that which is going on in the sky and everything else on the earth, the bigger picture of the chaos on the day of resurrection. Inshallah ta'ala, this surah, and, uh, is, is more deeply connected, even though it's a conclusion of the previous su- a few surahs in terms of its introduction of de- describing in great depth and with very powerful imagery what's going to happen on the day of resurrection. This is not the only subject of the surah. The surah shifts its subject almost halfway in and starts talking about another thing that was talked about before and how it connects. And that is actually the concept of risala. The concept of or the validity of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a messenger, and the fact that this message that comes to him is in fact the truth. Now, how it connects to the previous, inshallah, as we get to that point, then I'll share with you how the two things that were mentioned already before in Surah Abasa are perfectly connected and integrally important with what is going to be mentioned here, inshallah. So we begin. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ida shamsu kuwirat. A few things about the word ida first and foremost. Ida literally means when, and in the English language, when can be used for the past or the future. You could say, when I go to the office, or you could say, when I went to the office, right? So you could use the word when for the future or for the past. In the Arabic language, when you use the word when for the past, you don't say Ida, you say Ith. Ith. So when Allah Azza wa Jalla says Ith, right? Ith ja'atkum jududun fa'arsalna alayhim rihan, when armies came upon you, past tense. So when the, an event is mentioned that is speaking of the past, idh is used. When, is, when an event is mentioned that speaks of the future, idha is used. Idha is used, okay? Now, with idha, we know the context is already pushed to the future tense, or it's alluding to the future tense. But then in Arabic, there's an interesting feature that you can use the past tense or the present tense after idha. But we already know what does idha do. It makes the next statement future. It's future. So the tenses aren't really used in the way that we use them in normal language. In our speech nowadays, it's very rudimentary. Past means past, present means present, future means future. But in classical Arabic, these tenses had other functions. And one of the functions of the past tense, when you already know the statement is being made about the future, but you're still using the past tense, how does that, it seems like a a literary contradiction. The function of that is to speak of something for sure. Something so certain, it is as certain as the past itself. So when Allah speaks of something in the future, but it's guaranteed, or He's referring to its, its, its you know, unflinching or unquestioned reality, right? It's, it's bound to happen, it's inevitable, then that thing is mentioned in the past. So we, do hear, we don't find إِذَا shamsu تُكَوَّرُ That would have been the present tense. We find كُوِّرَتْ Which is الْفِعْلَ الْمَاضِي المبني على المجهول, right? It's the passive in the past tense. That's the second thing. So these are some language considerations. The tawqid, the emphasis is being laid out here by the use of the passive and also by the use of the past. We haven't talked about passive yet though. The second thing is normally, normally when the Arab speaks, then they use the verb first. That's the second thing. When normally the Arab speaks, he uses the verb first. So he wouldn't say, الشمس كوبيرات, he would say, كوبيرات الشمس. That's the normal mode of speech. So when the ism, which is the shams, the sun here, when it's been brought earlier, that indicates already an abnormality in speech. And that mode of speech is used on a number of occasions. One, it is used when somebody is saying something or you're trying to talk to someone who doesn't believe what you're saying. So you kind of have to raise your voice and you have to put it in ways that will make your statement more believable. It illustrates the frustration of the speaker, the anger of the speaker, the, even the volume of the speaker is illustrated when the noun comes first and it didn't have to, in other words. Okay? So now here what, what's happening is Allah Azza wa is speaking to those who are in denial of these facts. And Allah is saying to them by putting a shams first, the translation wouldn't just be when the sun is wrapped up in normal translation, when in fact the sun does get wrapped up. When it does in fact happen. So it's that in fact, that's raising of the voice, that's talking to the one who disbelieves in the Akhirah. These considerations are really important in the Qur'an. Why? Because they tell us who this surah is talking to. The language, the style of the language, the tone, the emotive tone, right? The, the verbiage, all of that illustrates who is, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking to because the Qur'an is guidance and a discourse for all of humanity. And within humanity, there are lots of different kinds of people. 
And sometimes Allah is talking to the good, sometimes to the people kind of in the middle, sometimes the people who've never heard anything before, sometimes those who are adamant in their disbelief. So you can tell from the language, the tone of the language, who the first and primary audience, even though all of it is directed for mankind and all of us, but who the primary audience is in this particular case, this is the worst of the kafir. This is the worst of the skeptic or the one in doubt, the cynical, right? Who spoke... You know, and we, we learned this already in the previous two surahs, who spoke about the Akhirah in very casual terms, uh, who didn't take this matter seriously. So a very threatening tone is being used from the very beginning of this surah. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ The other thing here, the final comment, so we talked a little bit about the importance of the use of the past tense, the beginning of the, uh, the noun, the ism, ash-shams. We talked a little bit about the word إِذَا, that it refers to something in the future. Something I should have said in addition about إِذَا is that instead of using إِذَا in, in English also you say if or when, right? When I go to work, I'll bring back something. If I go to work, I'll bring back something, right? So you could use when or if. Now when do you use if? When you're not sure about what's going to happen. When do you use when? When there is certainty. So we will find in the Qur'an sometimes إِذَا, sometimes in. And the in situation, it illustrates, it may, be, it may happen, it, might, it may not happen. But when إِذَا comes, it's definitely going to happen. Because when is certain, and far more certain than the phrase, if, right? So that's the other thing. Now, inshallah ta'ala, when we turn to these ayat, you will find quick succession. And the, the last comment about the language before we turn, we'll see the comment feature, is the passive nature of these words. Allah Azza wa Jal does not mention himself. When he speaks of these events, he does not say when Allah wraps up the sun. He says when the sun has been wrapped up, right? When the sun has been folded up. So the passive has been used. Now why, what's the literary function of the passive? How is that important to, for us to appreciate? You see, in, in, in language, and this is part of the psychology of language, in Arabic we'll call this part of balagha, of the eloquence of the Arabic language, you have to take into consideration who you're talking to. And we already established these ayat are talking to the most vicious of the kuffar, the most skeptic of them, the ones who take, make the most light of these matters. And these are the people the first thing that they disbelieve in is not even the akhirah. They're skeptical about this being, mes- this, this being a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our experience, normally, when somebody talks to you and you don't really trust them, you don't want to hear it from them, then before they even open their mouth, you've already passed your judgment. You don't want to hear it, right? So there are two, in communication, there are two things. There's the speaker and there's the speech, right? There's the speaker and there's the speech. If you've already passed judgment on the speaker, you don't want to hear it from the speaker. Then no matter what their speech, you're going to say, I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to be impressed. I've already passed my judgment. This is how people are. So think of someone who you don't agree with politically, like a political figure. You don't agree with them. No matter what they say in their speech, already before they even open their mouth, you see them come to the podium and you've already said, this guy is going to say something invalid or say something wrong. Right? So this is already, this is kind of a human condition. Now to overcome that, Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks in the passive, don't think about the speaker, think about what? The speech. That's what passive does. The passive form, it highlights the, 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 the idea itself without highlighting the speaker of that idea. So for example, if I say, قُتِلَ rajulu, a man was killed. A man was killed. I didn't highlight who told me or who killed. What did I highlight? The act of being killed itself. I'm highlighting the victim itself. So Allah is highlighting the sun and the stars and the things that the Arab stares at all day. These are the most, you know, uh, the inescapable things in his view all day. It's very different from our times now. And as, as I'm moving up, you know, south of uh, New York, I'm noticing we're a little more in touch with nature than, than we are in the farther east coast. But, you know, when I used to live in the city, you, you know, you go to work, you go, you go to college, you get in the train, you get in the subway, you get out, you walk down like a bunch of zombies, you don't even look at the sky. You don't even look at we're so it's such an unnatural state of being, right? That you know when you when you go down the street and you see like a little you know how sometimes the, the, the pavement has a crack and then grass comes out of it or a weed comes out of it? That looks unnatural. Right? It looks like it's out of place. And the reality is that's the only thing natural. Everything else is out of place, subhanAllah. Right? So we live in a very unnatural kind of uh, you know, uh, artificial kind of reality, right? We're not in touch with nature. But the Arab wasn't like this. He wasn't a zombie tra- traveling in subways and in large buildings and never even had the time to look up. He was always in touch with reality. That's what in front of him is the entire sky at night. That sometimes is his roof. He's not sleeping in an apartment building or in a house. He's sleeping out in the open sky, right? So he was very in touch with nature. Now, we begin, bismillah. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُبِرَتْ When the sun, and this is the most common name used for the sun, كُبِرَتْ Kuvirat comes from the word kawwara yukawiru takwir. 
which is the name of the surah, the infinitive form, the mustar of it, takwir. That's the, that's the name of the surah. It comes from the root letters kaf, waw, and ra, which literally mean to wrap something up. And there are different words in Arabic for wrapping up, like laf also means to wrap up. But this word is used specifically for turbans. More, more often than anything else, this word is used for turbans. The only other place we find a variation of this word used in Arabic literature is for horses when they wag their tails in circles. They'll say iktar al-faras, from the same root. Right? They'll say the, wa the horse is wagging its tail in circles. So for example, we find akar al-amamata ala ra'sihi, like a shawkani comments. And other scholars commented the same thing. That the person wrapped around the, tur the turban around their head. The idea is that the turban is long. Right? It's a long piece of cloth. And now you're making it, you're wrapping it around, and it, you're basically closing something off. The idea is the light of the sun is stretched out. And it's compared to the stretch of the long cloth of the turban. And on the Day of Judgment, what is Allah going to do with that light? He's going to wrap it up, fold it up. He's going to fold it up. Now this verb occurs in the Qur'an only one other place. We find, يُكَوِّرُ اللَّيْلَ عَلَى النَّهَارِ وَيُكَوِّرُ النَّهَارِ عَلَى اللَّيْلِ Allah Azza wa Jalla says He is the one who folds the night up on top of the day and folds the day on top of the night. You know, when you're wrapping up the head in a turban, then it gets it becomes invisible little by little by little until it becomes completely invisible. So the day loses its light little by little by little. It's like the ra the turban's being wrapped around it until it's completely closed off. So that's one of the implications of taqweer that the sun loses its light. That it's referring specifically to the light. And this is why we understand the tafsir of Ibn Abbas anhuma, when he said, Kuwirat ay udlimat, that it's been darkened, that the light has been wrapped up, the light's been taken away. Others have taken it more literally, not even the light, the sun itself will look like it's being wrapped up in something. The sun itself will look like it's being folded up and covered up, right? So you'll see the sun, but it's not giving off its light anymore. It's like something is covering it or hovering above it or around it. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. The other thing that ash shawkani comments, rahimahullah, he says about this word, uh, uh, takweer, actually he, he ties it to the next word, inkidar. Uh, in when it is in fact the stars that are going to have, they are going to be victims of inkidar. Inkidar means one to lose color, to lose brilliance. The opposite of kadra or kudra in Arabic is safa. Safa is pure, crystal clear. Right? And that's the, this is the antonym of it. So the stars will become dull. But he says, al -asl, the, the essence of inkidar, the essence of the, the falling of the sky, is actually al insibab, which means to fall. So first they're going to start getting dull, the stars. And you know, for us, because of pollution or whatever else, we don't really see the stars. But if you travel some of these states that, have, that aren't as polluted, or you go like upstate New York or something, or Arizona or places like that, and you look at the desert sky, it's, the, it's a different sky. And you won't even recognize, subhanAllah, how Allah has beautified the stars. And th this is one of the most brilliant features of night, especially out in the desert. And Allah Azza wa first mentions that they're becoming dull and stale in their color, in their brilliance. And then in, in Qadra also makes reference to the fact that they are now falling. So two things have now happened. The most brilliant portion of the day is collapsed. And the most stellar feature of the night. The mo I mean, the moon is in one place, but the stars are all over. Right? That's the most visible feature in the end of night. Wherever you turn, at least you'll see the stars. Right? That has now also lost its light, its, its, its brilliance, and it's falling apart. So this is what's happening in the sky. The next thing Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, وَإِذَا الْجِبَالِ And when even, even the, the mountains, سُيِّرَتْ When the mountains are made to move casually. And you know in Surah Naba, we found, وَسُيِّرَتِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ سَرَابًا Similar ayah. But there's the word suyirat was first and jibal was second. That was jumla fi'liya, that was in the fi'l form. This is actually more emphatic because it's talking to a tougher kind of kafir. This is a more adamant kafir. And so the, the language here is tough. Even the mountains are going to be made to move casually. And this is after Allah has mentioned subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous surah, wal jibala arsaha. The mountains that he, uh, you know, uh, or the, the, even before that, al-nazihat, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned the mountains that he pegged deep into the ground and now he's saying they're going to move casually. They're going to be uprooted and they're going to be floating about. And this tasir is used for casual walking. You know, sayyara for example, in Arabic, it doesn't mean like caravan, like Dodge caravan nowadays. It means the caravan of old times. You know, camels and horses and luggage and all of this traveling. It doesn't travel fast. It travels softly, easy travel. Okay, Sara means to casually take a walk in a garden or something like that. So suyirat al-jibal, it's not like a rough kind of movement, they're just floating away. So first you don't believe your eyes at what's happening at the sun, then you see the stars falling, and then when your eyes see the stars falling, what's the next thing you see? 
You see the mountains. And now the mountains seem like they're moving and you, don't, you kind of don't believe your eyes. What's happening over there? وَالسُّيِّرَةِ jibal. And you know for the Arab, the desert environment, a lot of the wild animals and beasts that they feared, they were up in the mountains. They were you know, closer to the mountains, there's more greenery, or there's more places, caves and things like this, where the dangerous animals can be. So that's where the animals were. Now what's the next thing that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions? He says, وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ This is very powerful actually. Ishar in the Arabic language is the plural of Ushara. Okay? And uh, Ushara are the she camels that are 10 months pregnant. It comes from Ashara. Ashara meaning 10, right? So the, the she camel, when it's 10 months pregnant, it's called Ushara, and the plural is Al Ishar. This was very, very important to the Arab. Like we find the comment, Khassal Ishar li annaha anfasu malin and al Arab, wa a'azuhu andahum. Right? This was highlighted by Allah because it's the most noble of wealth, the most precious of wealth, the most you know, uh, 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 coveted of wealth with the Arabs, and this was the most honored of them. I mean, this, this is some serious investment, and the one who owns this is like, it's a, a pride and joy for them. Okay? So now it's kind of like owning a high roller nowadays, right? or a, a good piece of real estate or something like that. It's a status symbol, and it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, right? So now Allah Azza wa says about these ishar, even these ishar uttilat, Atala means, literally means to become useless or to become not taken care of. And the Arabs would use it even for a woman if she's not wearing jewelry, if she's not like decked out in jewelry, they'll use Atala for her. But she's, she's not, be, she's not, seems like she doesn't have anything to do. She's kind of useless in society. And this is the Jahili Arab mind, right? They decked women out and this was their purpose for zina, for beautification. If she's not doing that, what purpose does she have? So there's that male chauvinist kind of attitude even in the language previously. Then Mu'attal. You know, a person who goes for a job and then his boss says, I don't have any more work for you, you can go. And he's been put to waste, is a person who's mu'attal. Allah uses in Quran, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses it in Surah Al Hajj when He talks about a town that's been destroyed. He says, Wa bi'rin mu'attal, right? Wa bi'rin mu'attala, rather. A, a well that has been put to waste, meaning the town is destroyed, khawiyatun ala urushiha, it's completely turned over, and there's a well in it. Of course, a well is a useless, useful thing. But when the town is destroyed, everybody's dead. What happens to that well? It's going to waste. It's being destroyed. So a bit in mu'attala. So Allah says about this most precious asset, He says, when it's been let go of, like nobody cares for it, it's wandering around use, useless. And this was the thing, if anybody saw it, they would see security around it, there's good fence around it. Right, they're taking care of it, it's got a rope on it, maybe even branded with the owner's name. This is a precious asset not to be left alone. But on this day when that chaos happens, when the human being who owns this kind of wealth sees the sun being wrapped up and the stars falling apart and the, the, the mountains moving, then Ishar is useless to him. He doesn't care about this anymore. And this is, understand the psychology of this ayah, subhanAllah. If you're in a burning building, if you're in a burning building, you're not going to talk about how much money you have in your 401k. Or you're not going to talk about how your investments are going. What's your only problem now? Get out of the building. You don't care about your investments. You don't care about your money. Everything is useless to you at this point, except your own survival. When somebody's crashing, you know, a, a plane crash or a shipwreck or something like that, and people are in the water, you don't care where your iPod went or where your laptop is. You don't care. So, وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ this is when the she-camel is let loose. One thing I want you to remember is this is the first pregnancy that is mentioned in this surah. We will find there are two pregnancies mentioned in the surah. And that's a very poetic, beautiful connection between the two things. This is the first one, when the she-camel is pregnant for 10 months. Okay? وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ Then Allah says, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ You know, this word, وَحْشْ هُوَ مَا لَا يَسْتَأْنِسْ مِنْ دَوَابِ الْبَرْ this is the animal that does not have affection for other creatures on the land. It cannot be domesticated, in other words. This is a wild animal. Okay, wahsh. Wahsh is the opposite of ins. Okay, and ins is a human being that has affection, and it can show affection to other creatures. But wahsh, a wild animal, a beast that is incapable of showing affection to others and attacks on sight. This is a kind of animal that's called wahsh. Another meaning of wahsh that's understood in Arabic literature, for example, they will say, Masha fil ardi wahshan. Uh, the, he walked on the earth with wahsh. What that means is he walked by himself. Nobody else was around him. This illustrates that this person was hard to get along with. And so whenever he walked, he didn't have any company. He was by himself. So that's, the two things are parallel. The wild animal, the dangerous animal, you will notice he's by himself. right? And then the, uh, the human being, when he walks, he walks by himself. Allah says about these wahush, these all forms of wild beasts and creatures, 
hushirat, that they will all be herded. Hashr is different from jam'ah. Jam'ah is to gather. Hashr also com commonly used for gathering. But hashr is actually used for herding animals specifically, gathering animals. And when you gather animals, you don't gather them on their accord. They don't want to be gathered. You force them, like the shepherd, right? He does hashr of the animals. He, get, he herds them forward. And this is one of the names of the day of resurrection, for example, yawm al-hashr, the day of herding. Because all human beings, against their own will, they will be herded towards al-arafah, right? They will herd it herd towards that one field where all of us have to be questioned. Now Allah mentions these kinds of animals. Now, when you think of being herded, you think of domesticated animals. But here Allah didn't mention al-an'am wa He said, al-wuhushu hushirat, wild animals. Animals that would never stand next to each other. And the only clo the, the thing that's close to this that you might be able to see in this dunya is when there's a flood, right? when there's a terrible kind of flood, and there's only a little patch of land left. The, you know, the, the, the two kinds of animals that otherwise would be at each other's throats are standing next to each other, both afraid of the water. They don't care that the food is standing right next to me or my killer is standing right next to me. There's a larger fear. So when the, an, the, the, the mountains start collapsing and the sun is falling apart, these huge calamities are taking place, these animals lose their natural instinct of attack or fear of each other. Instead, they have a larger thing to worry about, so they're standing right next to each other, herded together, one on top of another. This is one of the meanings of hashr. When you're gathered, really forced literally on top of each other, crunched together. This is the state of the animals. Now look at this interesting and beautiful contrast that Allah draws from the previous surah. In the previous surah, human beings were running away from each other. And in this surah, the animals are running towards one another. SubhanAllah. The catastrophe of that day, that, and again, this is a reversal of, human, of, of nature. By nature, these animals would not be herded together. And by nature, human beings would be together. And their nature is gone, so they're running away from, the human beings are running away from each other, even from the ones that they're always together with. And on the other hand, these animals, they would always be apart, and now they've been brought together. SubhanAllah, everything has been reversed. All the things we are used to are now been re reverse engineered. SubhanAllah, Azza wa Jal. Anyhow, let me move forward to the next catastrophic event. وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ and when even the mountains, and I say even the mountains, or, as a, as a, or rather the oceans, in fact even the oceans, I say even because Bihar is mentioned first. Not Sujirat al Bihar, but Ida al Biharu Sujir. And when this happens, now what is Al Bihar? It's the oceans. The word Abhur in Arabic, Abhur, is a, what's called Jam'u Qilla. It's a few oceans or few bodies of water. Bihar means all bodies of water collectively, all of them. So it's jam'u kathra, it's the plural of multitude. Okay, so even in Arabic there's this thing about singular, pair, plural, and super plural. They don't just have plural, they also have super plural. This is a super plural, all of the oceans, all of the oceans, the, the vast multitudes of bodies of water. They are all going to experience this tasjir. Now let's look at this word tasjir. Sajjarat tannur, an Arabic expression, is used when you have a large pot and you fill it with coal, and you fill it with fuel, and then you throw a fire in it. So you, you know, it's not full of things that are just flammable, they're actually used to excite flames. So that's the worst kind of flame. So one of the implications of that is that the water of the ocean will actually turn into fuel for a fire. That's how incredible this, this transformation will be. That water which we think of as the opposite of exciting flames, it's used to put out flames, will be used on that day to excite flames. The only thing we can compare that to in our time is when you have a fire and you put a few drops of water in it, what happens? It, you know, it gets excited, it gets sparked. So that fire will be so powerful that this ocean will seem just like drops being thrown into it. SubhanAllah that this, this fire will be blazed. Because of this, some scholars' opinion was that the hellfire is actually located underneath the oceans. Wallahu alam. But they said when it gets exposed, then this will just be like a drop thrown into a flame. It just gets to you know, explode like that. The other thing here is that it may be a, a means of ijaz. It, it may be allegory. It may not be literal. What this means then is when a flame is over, you know, excited in a pot, then its contents, they, they burst out. So what this may be is an expression of the oceans not staying within their boundaries, but they may be just popping out, blowing out of, of the oceans. The water is being overwhelmed by the flames underneath or the catast catast uh, catastrophic events on the earth that the, there's flooding taking place everywhere. And this may also, some, some commented, maybe this is because the animals are all herded together, that they see this boiling water coming towards them. So the oceans boiling over could be figurative and it can also be 
Literal, subhanAllah. وَإِذَنْ نُفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ Now look, all of these things were not about human beings. They were about either animals, they were about huge things like ocean and mountain and sun, big things. And all of a sudden, the, and by the way, this is from bad to worse to worse to worse. The things that are mentioning, that are being mentioned, are bad to worse to worse to worse. And now the, the worst of this so far, وَإِذَا النُفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ When people, persons, the plural of nafs, two kinds of plurals of nafs again. There's nafs, anfus, and nufus. Right? Anfusuhum, anfusikum, right? This occurs in the Quran too. Anfus is the weaker plural. Nufus is the multiplied, multiplied plural. Just like abhur and bihar. Anfus and nufus. So every single, all single individuals, all of them put together, all of them, zuwijat, they will be paired together. The zuwij in Arabic means to pair some things. Literally, it gets used for marriage also. Like if a father marries his daughter off, he will say zawajtuki. Right? I, I got you married. I paired you off with this man. Okay? So tazweej is used for that. But here it's being used in a larger sense. Like the, the statement of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu that is recorded by Imam al-Bayhaqi in tafsir of this ayah. He radiallahu anhu says, this means that the people who did good will be paired with the people that did good in Jannah and the people who did evil will be paired with the people who did evil in the hellfire. Imam Raghib al-Asfahani rahimahullah, he makes three opinions. He has three opinions about this pairing that occurs. He says, first, every group will be paired with their own, which is the, state, uh, which is the same thing Umar radiallahu anhu said. He says that the souls that had departed the bodies will now be paired with the bodies again, and that the people will be paired with their deeds. That the people will be paired with each of them with their own deeds. وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ So this pairing of the people, wallahu alam, the strongest qareena in the Qur'an at least, the, the evidence that supports this, the, of these opinions that occurs in the Qur'an is closest to the opinion of Umar radiallahu anhu. In that the Qur'an, Allah azza wa jalla, in another place he says, وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَاجًا ثَلَاثًا You are going to be paired up into three large groups. There is, you know, the people of the right hand, Ashab al-Yameen, Ashab al-Shimal, and then As-Sabiqoon, As-Sabiqoon, Ulaik al muqarrabun Right, so these three pairings that Allah mentions elsewhere, here he says people will be paired. So it may be a complement to that passage that occurs elsewhere. Subhanallah. Here, a little bit of a discussion on uh, the word nafs also. It's a very interesting term in the Arabic language. Uh, commonly translated as soul. Soul is probably not a good translation of nafs. Uh, the word nafs has many derivatives in its root form. It has many, many derivatives. For example, anfas in Arabic is breaths, when you take breaths. Okay? Uh, or tanafas, wa subhi, that tanafas is coming in the same surah, comes from the same root. Also means to take a breath. Okay, to inhale and exhale, etc. Okay, then there's al mutanafasa, or tanafus. Okay, so so you have uh, mutanafis or wa fi dalika fal yatanafas, or al mutanafisun. Right, this is the uh, the the meaning of competing against each other in 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 a spirit of healthy competition, not like competing against uh, in the state of like animosity, but like a friendly race. Or like a friendly competition, like we have, they don't, they're not friendly many times, but like, you know, Qur'an competitions for kids, right? These, this is, for example, from Tanafus. Now, what do all of these things have in common? A back and forth. Breaths, back and forth, right? Competition, back and forth, right? So, what does that have to do with nafs? A nafs is something that is always going back and forth. It's going back and forth between the states that Allah describes. An-nafs al-ammara, an-nafs al-lawama, an-nafs al-mutma'inna. It's always, it's not in one place. It's always moving. Either it's moving towards a desire, then it gets that desire, and it's moving towards embarrassment and humiliation, or it's, move, it's, it's relaxed, and then it moves out of relaxation into another desire. So it's always in motion. It's always moving. And that's really in the essence of the word, nafs. They will all be paired together. Now, inshallah ta'ala, وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ this is probably one of the scariest ayat of these for the kafir. Again, we're talking about the worst kind of kafir. We already established that. Allah Azza wa Jal says, when even al mauuda is an ism maf'ul, it's the feminine form of an objective noun. And what this comes from is wa'ada ya'idu wa'dan, to bury somebody alive. That's what that means, to bury someone alive. Wa'idha al mauudatu when the woman or the female that was buried alive, that's the word for her, mauuda. Okay. In a hadith that we find narrated by, uh, uh, I think it's Musa, uh, Salman, if you Salman Musa, if I find the name, I'll pull it up for you, inshallah. Yeah, Ibn Mas'ud actually comments on this, in this hadith. Al-wa'idatu wal mauudatu laha fin nar in hadith. The one who went and buried the child, 
and the one who had borne her, meaning the father who commanded that you go bury her, both of them are going to end up in the hellfire. Now here, this mawuda, Allah says she will be asked. Now in a, in a court, you know, you ask the criminal, you ask the criminal if he did it or not, then you go to the victim and you say, did you do it or not? But who's being asked here, the criminal or the victim? The victim's being asked. al mauda the one who was buried, even she is going to be asked. This is very powerful. It's an attack on the Quraysh in many ways. Number one, this is an attack because when, when you know, a, a daughter was born, according to Ibn Abbas, عنه, it's a very ugly event. They would, the woman, when she was about to give birth, she would actually go by the ditch and she would bear the child there. And if it's a boy, well and good. If it's a girl, they'll take care of it right there. They'll get rid of it, just buried alive. Why would they bury it alive? Number one, this was a questioning of their manhood. This was one thing. It was a questioning of their manhood. You're not man enough to have a son. This was a superstition they had. Another was that if she's a daughter, if she grows up, then she's going to be given off to another man, maybe from another tribe, and that will be a source of humiliation for our tribe. So the woman, a child being born, was a source of embarrassment in jahili culture, in ignorant culture. Okay? Some remnants of that even exist today in the Muslim world, sadly enough. That when a boy is born, everybody's congratulating you. But when the girl is born, you say, oh, inshallah, next time. You know, subhanAllah. <laughs> That's a horrible thing to say. Allah did not guarantee Jannah for people who have three, you know, or two or three sons. But Allah, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi did guarantee Jannah if you can raise three daughters properly, subhanAllah. Right? So it should, it's a means of, you know, inshallah, two more <laughs> when you have a daughter. That's the dua you make for somebody. Get, get into paradise. But you know, our, our mentality has been reversed. It's the mentality of the mushrik, really. To think that the son is a source of strength and the daughter is a source of weakness or embarrassment or a liability. Wallahu ta'ala alam. This is it's a horrible attitude of shirk. Anyhow, so she's asked, Why not Allah say, why did you kill her? Why not just ask the killer? When the killer is asked, no, the one who was born and was buried alive, she is being asked. Why? Because at that time, who was in charge of her when she was being born? Her father. Can anybody question that father? Can anybody come and stand? Can she complain to anybody? Does she have the power to speak? Does she have any right to defend herself? Any means by which she can make a case for herself? No. Nobody is there to hear her voice. He has complete autonomy and complete control over whatever he does with her. So now Allah has given her a voice. The one who didn't have a voice in this world. And this is a powerful lesson in the Qur'an. One of the first things that will happen on Qiyamah is the people who did not have a voice. The people who could not speak for themselves. The oppressed. Who nobody could hear their cries. Or nobody would hear their cries. And even if they did, they didn't, know, they didn't have any power to do anything about them. They will be empowered first. They will be asked first. And some of the ulama commented like Imam Raghib, this is because these were the people who desperately waited for justice for so long, they will be dealt with first. When all the chaos of the Qiyamah settles down, the first people to be asked are these people now. SubhanAllah. What, why, what crime were you killed for? So, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ The other thing that's, uh, that's mentioned by Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah is very interesting. He says, أَنَّ تَوْجِيهَ السُّؤَالِ إِلَيْهَا لِإِظْهَارِ كَمَالِ الْغَيْضِ عَلَىٰ قَاتِلِهَا حَتَّى كَانَ لَا يَسْتَحِقُ أَنْ يُخَاطَبْ that this illustrates that by asking her and not the killer, this illustrates the extent, the incredible extent to which Allah is angry at her killer, that he doesn't even deserve to be talked to. In order to punish him, Allah will talk to the victim and then execute the punishment, won't even turn towards him. This is an illustration of how, how angry Allah Azza wa is at him. And this is a style in the Qur'an against those who Allah is extremely angry at. For example, when Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about the Christians who had taken Allah, Allah you know, t- given Allah a son Allah, on the Day of Judgment, you don't find Allah yelling at or, or punishing or scolding the Christians. You find a dialogue between Allah and who? Isa alayhi salam. But that's not because he's angry at Isa, because they don't deserve that they should be addressed. They did such a big crime. Anta qulta nas. Did you say to people, were you the one who said this? And Allah already knows. Right? If I was the one who said it, you already knew. But the, all of this is an illustration of how Allah ang- is angry at these horrible, horrible criminals. If you look at the previous surah, some things were left in the general. You know, maybe the, maybe the kafir didn't get it when Allah said, قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَ May the human being be destroyed. How, how amazing the extent of his disbelief. Look at the expression of his disbelief. He's willing to do this to a baby girl. This is the extent of the kufr he can go to in his own society. This is the manifestation, the evil that comes out of kufr. You know, our ulama comment that the root of all good is tawheed. And the root of all evil is 
shirk and kufr. These are the if you have if you don't have iman in Allah, then any other evil deed is minuscule compared to that. You'll be able you're capable of doing it when iman is gone. Subhanallah. So qutila al insan ma akfara. Now here Allah Azza wa says bi ayy dham bin qutila. For what crime exactly? What sin exactly did she do that she was killed for? What, for what crime was she killed? The word them comes from dhanab and it can be used for the smallest, smallest infraction. The smallest, minutest thing. Like if you're talking about sins on the street, then a parking ticket could be a them. Okay? It's the minus, minutest thing could count as them and could be big thing or small thing. So basically what's being told to us, is, is there even a smallest thing? Can you find even the smallest bit of a crime that this girl committed for which she was killed? That's with the word them benet sayyi'ah. There's not even a question of finding a huge sin for her. Find me something small that she even did. That she deserved that she be killed. Subhanallah. Bi ayyi dhambin qutilat. But then this is only one of the things that are exposed. This is, I mean, this is the one that nobody would ask for. Nobody th thought that they were accountable after they did that. Right? They just walked away from it like nothing. It's part of the culture. Who cares? There's nobody, you know, if you kill somebody else, like a member of somebody, some other tribe, at least their tribe people will come and say, well, you kill our guy. There's some sense of consequence. With killing, killing the ma'udah, there's no sense of consequence. You just walk away. This was the culture. So now Allah Azza wa mentions that which you would never have thought twice about first, but then says that's not the only thing. إِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ When all of the scrolls, and these scrolls are the sahaif al-a'mal. These are the scrolls of deeds that have been recorded. When they're laid out, spread out, opened up. Now the, the thing of it is, the word nashara come, came last time. ثُمَّ أَمَاتَهُ فَأَقْبَرَ ثُمَّ إِذَا شَاءَ أَنْشَرَ The word anshara came there. It was to spread out, also means to bring to life. So it's almost as though these scrolls will be spread out and brought to life. The contents in them will come to life before the people. The other thing here is the word suhuf. It came before also. In the previous surah we found فِي صُحُفٍ مُكَرَّمَةٍ مَرْفُوعَةٍ مُطَحَّرَةٍ In the previous surah there was suhuf and now there's suhuf. Two kinds of suhuf. There the suhuf were referring to revelation. Here the suhuf are referring to the, your, the, the, the scrolls enclosing all of your deeds. If you don't care about those suhuf, you will be in trouble with these suhuf, right? Those suhuf, are, those suhuf came, those scriptures came, so you can fix these scrolls that are being recorded. So the two things are now complemented, subhanAllah. وَإِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ And this is actually connected with the rest of the passage. You would think when Allah spoke about the star or the sun and the sky, or rather the sun and the stars and the mountains, you were expecting to hear about the sky over there. But there's a break and now Allah mentions the sky. Why does he mention it here? There's some literary functions of it that we'll see immediately when we come to the next ayat. What time is Aisha, by the way? 9.15. 9.15, okay. So we'll end at 9.10, inshallah. Okay. So, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ You guys know what the word sama means, right? That which is above. Literally, it means that which is above. Commonly speaking, sky, but it's a little more comprehensive than that. Then there's the word kushitat. It comes from kashata. Like kashata al-ba'ir, he skinned the camel. To peel the skin off the camel once you slaughter it, this is kashat. Kashat is a butcher. Because one of the first things he does before he starts chopping away is what? He skins the, skins the thing. So it's kashat. Okay? Uh, similarly, kishat is the peeled skin itself. Now, one of the, this could be literal. It will feel like the sky has a skin and it's being peeled. But it's more appropriate to understand the imagery of the ayah here. Allah Azza wa Jal, in another place he mentions when the sky on the day of judgment will be red. فَكَانَتْ وَرْدَةً كَدِّهَانَ In Surah Al-Rahman. Right, it'll turn like a rose and a brilliant red. Here Allah says the sky's skin will be peeled. When its sky's skin will be peeled. When you skin the or, or peel the skin of an animal, what's exposed? The red. Right? The red flesh, the blood, that's what's exposed on the inside. So it's illustrating how blood red the sky is gonna turn. It'll look like its skin has been peeled. That's what's being said. But then it begs the question: why would the sky look red? The sky is a reflection of what's going on on the earth, it reflects the textures of the earth. So the sky looks blue, especially blue over the ocean because it's a reflection of the earth. Now when something's going on on the earth that is so vicious in color that even the sky has turned red. So now let's look in the next ayah to find what is it that has happened on the earth. وَإِذَا الْجَحِيمُ سُعِرَتْ And when even the hellfire has been blazed and sa'ara is to cause a fire that towers high. 
So you put things in the fire that makes the flame reach higher and higher and higher. So when the jahim, this vicious hellfire, this glaring and staring hellfire has been given towering flame. That's su'ira, not just blaze. Blaze is too common for too many words in the Qur'an. Burrizat al-jahimu, su'irat al-jahimu, every word gets blazed. But this is actually a towering kind of flame. And it towers so high that its redness is now even affecting the texture of the sky, making the sky look like it's been peeled, subhanAllah. But now understand how this is beautifully connected, and in a scary way connected to what we read in the conclusion of the last surah. In the last surah we found some faces towards the very end. وَوُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَلَيْهَا غَبَرَةٌ تَرْهَقُهَا قَتَرَةٌ Right? Some faces on that day, they're going to have this black dust on them, right? And overwhelmed with black smoke. Black smoke from what? From this blazing torch of a fire that has overwhelmed them in smoke and they're just blackened by it. This is, this is, the two things are now connected together. This is the fire, these are the faces. How, how one, it's like the camera angles. Nowadays we appreciate that in film very easily. The camera goes here, then the camera goes there. Right? And that's how the, the, the language of the Qur'an is. It makes you look here, then it makes you look there. It makes you visualize these things. So, وَإِذَا الْجَحِيمُ سُعِرَتْ وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ أُزْلِفَتْ Such a beautiful word. When the, when the paradise is brought close. The word uzlifat is the passive form. When, when al-jannah, when the lush garden is brought near. This illustrates one for one the paradise already exists. Because if it didn't exist, it, was, it would be created, but it's been brought near. It's waiting for the believers. May Allah enter all of us into the paradise. In the previous surah, we found another kind of face. We found wujuhun yawma idhim musfira dahikatum mustabshira. In the previous surah, some faces are lit bright. Like they're looking at something brilliant and their face turns bright and they can't stop laughing. They can't wipe the smile off their face. What have they seen? There's Jannah that has been brought. Close. وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ أُزْلِفَتْ Now look, uh, uh, some things about the word uzlifat. Zulf in Arabic means a portion or a great portion of something. The, the word zulfa means status. Zulfa means status. وَإِنَّهُ لَهُ عِنْدَنَا لَزُلْفَ وَحُسْنَ مَآبِ When Allah speaks of Sulaiman alayhi salam, He says He has high status with us. He uses the word zulfa. Now, Allah did not say, وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ قُرِّبَتْ When the hellfire is brought close. He said, وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ أُزْلِفَتْ Another word that you may know that is close to the word uh, azlafa is the word muzdalifa. I mean, izdilaf. When the ta becomes fused with dal, izdilaf. Muzdalifa is the field or the, the region that you stop, which is very close to Mina. That's why it's called the close by. It's the close by place. And it is also an honored place. When somebody is brought close, somebody is brought close in order to honor somebody. So in other words, al Jannatu Uzlifat means when paradise is brought close in honor of the believers. This is in honor of them. Qurriba just brought close. But this this uh, Islaf actually is to bring close out of honor. So the paradise has been depicted as an honorary gift to the believer. It's like an award ceremony. Subhanallah. Wa idha al-jannatu uzlifat. Another uh, interesting place we find this word in, in a, one of its variations is in a hadith. This hadith is re- reported by Sulaiman ibn Musa. Anhu. He says, Izdalifu ila Allahi bi rak'atayn. Come closer to Allah, honor yourself by coming closer to Allah by making two rak'ah. Right? Every time you want to come close to Allah, make two rak'ah. It comes in the singular form in another narration also. Is dalif ila Allah bi rak'atayn. Plural and in singular. One last comment about this ayah. We find Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in another place, and this is your homework, find it where it is. Wa uzlifat il jannatu lil muttaqina ghayra ba'id. Allah says, wa uzlifat il jannatu lil muttaqin ghayra ba'id. Now here we find وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ أُزْلِفَتْ The other place we find أُزْلِفَتْ الْجَنَّةُ So this is the noun first and that one is what? The verb first. And what did we say? What's the normal way of speech? The verb first or the noun first? The verb first. That place Allah illustrates how easy it is for Allah to bring the jannah close to the believers. Easy like the fi'l form of the sentence is easy. Here he speaks to the kafir and realizes who thinks the only thing close to these, these believers is destruction and poverty. And Allah says, no, no, no. In, as a matter of fact, the thing being brought close to them and the honor that's going to be given to them is al-jannah itself. So this is actually illustrating the shocking way and the strong way in which Allah talks about the jannah coming to the believers to the kafir. Understand, when we think Allah is talking about jannah, who do we think about? Allah is talking to who? The kafir. 
to the believers. Here, no, he's slapping the disbelievers, saying, no, the honor is in fact coming to the believers. That's why, the jannatu uzlifat. At the end of all of this, there's a fi'liya sentence. This is, this is a sentence that begins with a verb. All of these began with what? A noun. But the conclusion of all of them, jawab ash these are all jumla shartiya, by the way. When, 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 when. When you say, when I go here, when I go to school, when I finish my job, when I finish reading this book, right? When I write my paper, then, and you stop there, then the person says, well, then what? What are you going to do after that? Why are you telling me when? Because a when statement, you need to conclude it. There needs to be a conclusive statement, right? A concluding remark. The concluding remark for all of these previous statements is one statement. And that is, alimat nafsum ma ahdarat. Every person knows what it forcefully brought forward, what it has to present for itself. We'll talk about the word ahtarat in a second, but first of all realize this, in its simplest form, every person knows what it has to present, what he or she has to present before Allah. That's the basic idea of the ayah. And it's presented in fi'l form. Allah didn't say nafsun alimat ma ahdarat. He said alimat nafsun, the normal form is used. Why? Because this conclusion that every person knows full well what it has to present for itself is not some high or inescapable, some hard to imagine concept. Everybody already knows that. Everybody already knows inside, we know very, very well what idea, what, what actions I have to present for myself, what I've done for myself. Everybody knows this. So Allah puts it in the natural form. Alimat nafsu ma because this is a natural conclusion for the human being. For the kafir even, this is natural to him. Even he knows what he's done. Even he knows what he, has to, what he has to show for himself, literally. So there's a transition in the language to illustrate this is already within yourselves. This is not some abstract thing that you never heard about before, like the sun being wrapped up, or the stars falling apart, or the mountains moving, or the oceans boiling over. That may seem unnatural to you, so a stronger form of language is used. But this is something deep within your psyche. You already know this. Alimat nafsu ma ahdarat. So this is the conclusion. Now, here's the thing. Understand, when there's a jawab shart, it goes back to every jumla shartiya, every single shart that was there. In other words, to understand and appreciate this word, every person knows what he has to present for himself. First, we go back to every ayah that we read before. Number one, So when the sun gets folded up, a person will go, what do I have to present for myself? Then he looks at the stars, then he concludes, what do I have to show for myself? Then he sees the mountains moving, then he says, what do I have to show for myself? Then he sees the ishar traveling, he doesn't care, he's only worried about what he has to show for himself. Then the vicious animals are standing next to each other, he's still considering about, concerned about himself. This is actually the most beautiful tafsir of the previous surah we found, For every single person on that day, there will be a preoccupation that will make him unconcerned about everything around him. So he sees the sun, he sees the mountains, he sees the stars, he sees the animals, he sees the oceans, all of it he sees, but what's the conclusion of all of it? Man, I know, what I, I know what's coming. I know what's coming. That's all he can think about is himself. Alimat nafsu ma ahdarat. Subhanallah. Let's talk a little bit about the word ahdarat here. First of all, in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa has given the human being an opportunity to fix what he has to show Allah. To fix himself. There he, he mentioned to him that he created him from a nutfa, that he, you know, he precisely calculated him, thumma sabila yassarahu, he laid out the path for him so he may live his life with guidance. He facilitated the path of guidance for him. Thumma amatahu faakbarahu, then eventually he gave him life, or gave him death and put him in his, had him put in his grave, right? So all of this was the op- time of opportunity for this person to fix and to show f- something for himself. But now, if he wasn't able to do so, then the concluding comment there was, Kalla lamma yaqdi ma amara. No, the human being was not able to fulfill what his Lord had commanded him to do. He wasn't able to do justice to that act. Now, if you, you know, just like a child who hasn't done the homework assignment and shows up or hasn't studied for the test, and now the, the test results are about to be given, handed back. Before they're even handed back, does the kid already know what he knows what he got? He knows deep inside. He's already feeling it, right? So. <laughs> Alimat nafsun ma ahdarat. So that it's already too late. You, were, you had the opportunity to study, to prepare, to fix yourself. You didn't take a chance of that. Now you know what's coming. So that's basically what the ayah is saying. You know what's coming. You know what's coming. Now, hadara to present itself, to present, or to be present even, hadara. Like hadarna dars. We, we, we were present for the dars, right? We were present for the lesson. Ahdara 
is to take something and bring it for presentation, and it actually includes the implication of iltirar, right, of forcing. Meaning you bring something forward on stage and it doesn't want to be there. A reluctant presentation. Every person knows what is it that they have to present for themselves. And you know, even the believer is going to be nervous on that day. He's not fully confident until the whole scales have been counted. So everybody's nervous about what they have to present. And this presentation is not even something voluntary. They're reluctant about it. That's captured in the word ahdarat. So every person knows what's about to come. By the way, just a, a quick few comments before we take a break. About this word ahdarat and amal. They have been paired in the Quran in more than one place. The actions being presented. Allah Azza wa says in Ali Imran, يَوْمَ تَجِدُ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ مُحْضَرًا Right? The day on which every person, from any good thing they did, they'll see it presented right before them. مُحْضَرًا From the same hadara, like ahdarat here. It's the same maf'ul of the same pattern even, from, from if'al. Then Allah Azza wa says, وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا In Surah Al-Kahf. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا They will find whatever they did standing right in front of them. So it's like our actions have been given a visual form. This is similar, or it's an opening up of what Allah said before, وَإِذَا صُحُفُ نُشِرَتْ When the scrolls have been given life, when they've been spread out open, it's like you can see your deeds in front of you, standing right there in front of you, looking you in the face like a mirror. So we'll stop at this ayah, inshallah ta'ala, because the next series of ayat are basically the next passage and the next half of the surah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.